becomes an active agent. Um, and accepting this reorientation in the thinking about plants, it opens vistas for, the, for both the natural and the social science to be able to investigate plants as more than just passive objects that are available to human worlds. In this way, researching plants in human worlds as co-constituted and seeing plants as active agents, which can be theorized in and of themselves by the human sciences becomes possible. For some theorizing plants, it's not a matter of a deep intelligence, but rather a question of thin description. Or, put another way, flat ontologies and weak theory. And these simply focus in on the surfaces of plants. It does not mine them for deeper meaning. So there's, uh, there's really two kinds of trends within critical plant studies. Those that look at the kind of proliferation of images and representations and metaphor around plants. Uh, and there's another kind of school within the critical plant studies that say, no, plants are only, only their surfaces. They're only as much as they are. They do nothing more than feed plants. And the important thing, and, you know, if we're going to spend a lot of time mining them for meaning, we are actually just uh, reflecting the human world and not an actual plant world. So uh, it sounds simplistic, but it's, it's actually quite profound. So in order to understand what plants do, you have to understand them just as plants. Right. And then there's a, there's a couple of other things. I mean, for instance, one of the things that um, that uh, plant philosopher Michael Mather suggested, you know, you know, as long as we instrumentalize plants, as long as we think of them as providing us with oxygen, as being the same as the planet in terms of trees, as you know, carbon sinks, or as food, or as even uh, in ornamentals and such, as long as we imagine them as such, we're not really understanding them because we're not allowing them to be plants. We're, we're, we're pulling them in, into, or we're enrolling them in a very human world. Okay. So what happens at this juncture where the vegetal and human meet? This regard, it is necessary to, to say briefly what it is that a plant does. Now, Marta posits that the plant is something that makes nature what it is by bringing together in a non totalizing way its various elements. And further, the plant material, materially articulates and expresses beings that surround it. This material articulation and the discursive place that is captured uh, or is captured um, through what or through a focus on telling stories and revealing partial connections, as suggested by, by Marilyn Strandberg. And these partial connections are those that plants and here specifically quickly disclose. It is in the partial connections that plant thrives, and where all the stories and theorizing by humans come into being, and where it is rendered visible. Uh, both image and madly. By placing plants at the center of our stories and research, we can reveal a rich and tapestry that even rise on that as well. As the plant is the central actor in the thinking about the very human world we inhabit, but also the world in itself. It is in this material, uh, it's in the material articulation, partial connections, and disclosure of worlds that the agency of plants is situated. However, the ethnography of plant remains troubled by the human world, since we cannot escape our own formulation, and the plant world in its nature is not available to us completely. We are too involved in our ways of thinking and language that we are literally, in the words of Eduardo Cohen, cosmologically autistic when it comes to where it concerns the world of plants. It might not be possible ontologically to grasp the vegetal, uh, vegetal domain fully, so we have to grasp it instead at the various pronouncements about this realm. What is offered in this world of prolific representation and theorization, the world of theorizing vegetal um, uh, and uh, grants humans access to a fertile terrain for theorizing their own worlds, as I said. Um, Marner suggests that this is because plants remain completely available to their other, in other words, or in this case rather, to humans. To fully comprehend this theorization, I depend on the work um, Cannibal Metaphysics by the Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Castro, in which he argues that the other of the West is not a person without theory, and that the other does indeed engage in a kind of relative uh, anthropology 
and that they are indeed theorizing their worlds with content often drawn from their ontologies of creatures such as plants and animals. In other words, the concepts and perspectives and views that make up the cosmology of the other must not be caught up in language. It in fact takes elements from the world, uh, material elements of the world, such as plants, animals, to think the world. The gist is to show how plants bring together parts of the world and how I think of these worlds, uh, or thinking these worlds through partial connections, the, the other actually theorizes the world. We thus are not, uh, we thus think not just about, but actually with plants. There's one final note on the theory concerning plants, and that is um, the work of, of, of Timothy Nealon. Timothy Nealon suggests that the radical other of the human is not the animal, but indeed the plant. That the animal is actually us. We are also animals. This has implications for how we think the world and our relationality to uh, of the of, uh, to the domain of life. If the animal is a companion, then the plant is the other, especially through the discourse of science. The science creates these categories. The, the Colgan point as well, one could say. The category of life that science constructs for plants is far removed from the from the that of the world of humans. This world has its own ethics and has been brought in, uh, or has been thought of in Western metaphysics as alive but not alive in the same way as human and animal. This is important because it allows traditional, or it allows the traditional anthropological other, in other words, uh, that other that we construct in our practice as anthropologists, to have on hand another. And this another other, or another other, this the second other, is that of the plant. The other that is the human and the animal together can thus do their theorizing, not as a simple matter of occidental critique, but from the realm of biopolitical. So Neil suggests that, you know, we should be reading plants from the biopolitical. And there hasn't really been a lot of work uh, that reads plants in the biopolitical. Um, I myself uh, have not ventured down that route, but I'm, I'm noting here that this, this is a necessity in terms of the theory. So let me get back to the ethnography now. So in this workshop, the participants were asked to search the grounds and the garden and the surrounds uh, for a plant to photograph, think with, and write about. So the, the, the participants dispersed into the garden to find the plant that has meaning to them. And, it's at, uh, and it is at this, at this time that I receive a kind of invitation. Peter Takello, one of the workshop participants, um, who's also a teacher, mentor, and a knowledge holder in this community, suggests to me, um, let's have a look here where it's dry. He was inviting me into a world that some people may see, that to some people may see aesthetically as even a sparsely vegetated world of dry bushes and hard stony soil. What he finds there is the plant known as koi, a well-known and widely used medicinal plant known to the Western science by its binomial Helichrysum petiolari. He says that this plant is important to him for several reasons, but mainly because it is medicinal, and secondly, because it's emblematic of his culture, the koi culture. However, this invitation to find Koivu spoke about so much more than simply his culture. It was, it was a vehicle for him to theorize a vegetal geography of colonialism and apartheid. Before we discuss the plot further, um, let us consider what is caught up in this invitation that I received from Peter Jagello. He invites me to look where it's dry and more arid more like what the season and thus the climate of this place at this time of year is. The rain season had been short and the felt was still the grind. Many of the bushes and annual grasses had already begun to yellow and brown. The moisture of the rainy winter was evaporating in the November sun. It can be asked why he would want to go there when a lush green garden with many species was at his disposal. I said on this, Peter is asking me, inviting me, to look where it's dry, and it is as if to say, come look here, I will show you a past and, in, and a female presence in the plants and the felt. What would lead me to speculate in this way? 
Well, he knew where to find his chosen plant. And above all, he found one that embodied his chosen culture. Peter is a Poi activist, and the Poi group is important to the Poi people, and is used in their ceremonies and rituals, as well as in such modern sounding events as meetings. He says that they burn Poi with the meetings to invite the spirits into the space. This plant is then the invitation not only, uh, to not only good spirits, but also to an endless and global Poi. Plant chosen was and still is central to his practice or to, uh, to the practice of his poiness. Along with the same invite, Peter was avoiding the well-watered garden of the venue where we were working. Um, and this garden has a lot of these imported plants. Many of the species had been imported by settlers who found the local species unappealing and wanting, or they brought with them ornamentals and charismatic species of plants from the elsewhere of South Africa. There was a stark contrast between the two spaces, one being semi-formal and the other, the fell, growing with its own logic of species, soil, moisture, wind, and microclimates. Peter seems to find this tailored garden just distasteful, as is evident in his face and his body language. He literally turns his back to the garden and avoids looking at it. He was looking for wild plants, the drought-resistant plants of the fell, and not the imported species of the town's gardens that needed to be pampered, uh, pampered with constant watering, watering, the task that the gardener was performing as we wanted that space. To him, the plants that are part of his practice every day got to be found in these well-watered gardens with the wealthier and most likely white residents of the town. He was looking for the wild plants. And these were the drought-resistant plants of the felt and not the imported species. He admits that where they, people of color, live, and in the ancient, or as he calls it, uh, original state of the felt, plants that were important were really those that loved and thrived in the arid conditions of the Karoo. The contrast of wet and dry environments reflects the cultural and physical divide between settling and indigenous forming. This divide is created and seen through the plants that they find there. European plants in gardens that are well kept and watered, indigenous plants that are naturally grown in historically significant felt. He bemoans not only the aridness of, aridness of their neighborhoods, colored neighborhoods, um, which, are, which seem dry as a strong neglect, but he also refers to the question of access and affordability to water. He exclaims that water resources have been captured and are being monopolized by certain residents who guard, who closely guard access to rivers and streams and forests um, for irrigation and leisure purposes. He claims that landowners chase them away. Uh, from sites where there's water and where they want to rest next to trees or under trees that are next to stream. To him, it is no accident that a particular species or group of species adorn the well kept and watered garden in certain parts of town. These plants, in fact, suggest to him traces of their apartheid separation. Water is kept in reserve for certain racially described and wealthier residents of the town. And the lush gardens are the result of this route of catching. So you see, Peter is really he's telling you this really interesting story by simply referring to this one dry looking plant in felt and avoiding the garden. Peter's invitation is there's not just an invite to see the natural indigenous vegetation, nor is it merely an invite to see the lingering vestiges of apartheid as it is seen through the distribution and impact of plant life. In my imagining, it asks us to come into a past to read and understand the history of the people who planted. Further, for Peter, the, the Koiku and its resilience showed up a kind of wanting of a perfect, a spirit and a practice that is supposed to be dead, but lingers in the everyday lives as a reminder that it was there. Koiku serves as a reminder of what was there and what it what and is what registers as a plant of the people wild, dry, and available for consumption and reference. The sites and spaces of haunting, haunting such as streams and gardens are taboo and forbidden, and the colored residents avoid these as if they contain spectres. The ontology of plants, and um, how many leave that? Good. Yeah, you got 20 minutes or so? 20 minutes. 20, 20, 25. I'm sure I have more than enough material for that, but you see how far I get. 
people still people still like it? Very okay, good. So this time we talk I'm um, um, wanting to change the whole quality of plant. So to many people, uh, to many but not all humans, plants are merely backdrop in the course of their lives. Western philosophy has treated plants no different. Plants are thought of as context, but a context that is left a largely uninterrogated. And this relegation of plants to the margins of our lives and thinking is known by the term plant blindness. Simply put, most humans do not see plants, but it certainly does not mean that they are not there or central to the planetary scale. <clears throat> the argument is that plants exist as green noise, or in the hiding this term as a COVID problem. That is, um, that is that plants are always playing their songs that seem to us have so much background noise. This green noise is like a haunting presence. It's not quite sense, but if we stand still, we may notice the ghost and the constant hum of plants at the edges of our consciousness. They leave traces in our consciousness. They emerge occasionally as instrumentalized produce and useful metaphor. But they are only absences. Franken, who uh, follows Derrida, argues that it is exactly these absences, just not noticing plants, that are the key defining aspects of the whole ontology of plants. That, and this is that moment when they inhabit our world by their absences. In our work, Peter has asked us to consider the absences, the untold story that he sees in the plants himself. He draws us closer to the stories that are not being told about plants, the Kuna and its existence, and he presents us with the ontology of point. Let's take a moment to consider the plant itself. I'm not, sorry, I didn't uh, I don't have the image of the plant. People know what point is? Anybody? No, she's saying the plant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you guys yeah, yeah. shared it around. You've got to take some how it looks, right? Okay, I'm going to take a closer look at it. Let's take a moment to consider the plant itself, its materiality, and as it appears, and we can see that there's an apparition here. To be observed with the plant is an ashen gray and could just as well be a dried out and dead plant, appearing as a remnant of its life and or as a remnant. Its life seems drained by the hot, cool sun. One could imagine that if you put a match to it, it would go up in flame. The dry and dusty hoary bush is the color of a clean whitewashed skeleton, and the opaque leaves gives the stem the look of knobbly leg bone. Pink and broken, the stem is even cracked and crunched like bone. When it is burned in whichever sundry ritual, the gossamer smoke curls upward and it forms a shape like the white shroud of the sand. Stem passes, uh, the smoke passes quickly as the stems burn out and it dissipates like a mist. It is ethereal. What if we too choose a different adjective to designate the color of point? Just a silvery gray bush. What if I describe it as a silvery white, a shine that can be seen from afar? Little white hairs on the leaf are, are there as an adaptation to protect the plant from desiccation by reflecting the sun's rays a reflection that speaks of a certain kind of light. The late anthropologist Deborah Bird Rhodes, uh, Rhodes in her work with Abor uh, Aboriginal Australians, speaks about the concept of vertigoon, which she describes, she and others have translated as shimmer. Shimmer is a distinct concept applied, um, applied to a certain livelihood, uh, kind of liveliness that comes about with the renewal and waning of season of growth in the wild. It also figures the liveliness and the symbiosis that exists in these multi-species systems. Koifut has this shimmer. In the winter, it is redeemed, and the green shows with the silvery gray, white leaves of the new shoots that appear after the rain. In summer, it dons a gray coat again, all the while still shining and shimmering. If the shimmer is about light, maybe the faint ghostly light is the Koifut, then it is also about beauty. Wanted by strange lights in the day and, cer and certain seasons, mirages that are in the felt that suggest but never truly reveal their presence, faint yet there. Again, Koyfut looks and acts like a ghost. 
I want to return to gardens briefly. Think a little bit about the haunted garden of Barry Lynn. There's no doubt that plants can print stories. In this sense, the plant represents an archive of stories that holds an excess of information that figures of past. Michael Pollard argues that, among others, the reading of gardens we can offer is that these spaces are histories that include the stories about plant species, the origins of these plants, as well as personal mm -hmm. who planted what and where plants came from. The garden is thus a history text. One further account to illustrate this gardening is history in a novel way. Yvette Abrams, is the indigenous scholar um, and soon to be head of the Poisson Center at, at UCT, um, was also a coy activist, suggested that Dr. Alfie based uh, a, a column from Belgium that she gardens as biography. She is scripting the story of Sarah Bartman in her own garden, she said. And we are reproducing the violence, both actual and academic violence, of the story of Sarah Bartman. She explores other routes of telling the story by planting indigenous plants that may have been known to Bachman and exploring their uses specifically in the manufacture of soap. The manufacture of soap references the Koi tradition of making soap and domestic labor um, that had to perform. And so it seems a fitting homage to Sarah because she also worked as a domestic labor and probably made soap. Abrams, Abrams further references the memorial garden in Hanky, where Sarah Bartman is, is buried or where her remains have been interred. And she does intimate reads of the meanings and agencies of the different plants that dwell around in the garden around um, Sarah Bartman's grave. And um, she looks also at the way that these plants, or that also suggests that these plants are a way uh, to occupy this place. This great site um, from across time, bringing the spirit together in this garden of remembrance. So, in these examples, we can clearly see how gardens are history, but can the cells equally be read as a history? The connections of biography and gardens by Jesus, and we can see it in the stories of both the plants and the people. We see it in the labor and care, as well as in the tales of pride and plants, just to name a few. The garden is a story of who planted, which plant, how this plant came to be there, who gifted it or shared it or purchased it. This planting is also a story of nurture and care, what kind of attention and resources were invested in plants. And also tell uh, the stories of a particular person who may have passed on, um, may have passed on, uh, may have passed on, died, and um, be right there. Um, and who brought the plants there and first cared for them. This care is often intergenerational. For instance, I'm still indirectly responsible for a garden planted by my father. And through this intergenerational and temporal lineage, the dead are still born to gardens, and we care for the spring spaces as if the dead are watching. Nathan shows how this intergenerational care is lavished on house plants. Now, participants work with these as if the care um, that as if the care is indicative of how they cared for those deceased um, who originally cultivated the plants. So the care we gave to people while they were alive, we care for plants with the same care once they've passed on, this is what Nathan is suggesting. Um, Giovanni Alloy argues that plants in gardens become placeholders for memory, and that some plants may even reach mythical status because they, they came from a particular person or they represented some scarce variety. Plants are also haunted by the many deaths that have preceded them and exist as ghostly forebears in their, in their and our family tree. Each plant is the result of the death of another that preceded it, thus contains the remnants of the dead that have gone before it. Now, if we ask who does the labor in God, it discloses another biography, that of the garden laborer. In the racist and infantilizing parlance of South Africa, it was also known as the garden boy. This diminutive ascription refers to the person who often performs and is paid to do the actual work of gardening, especially the more, lab uh, the more labor intensive aspects of the process. In South Africa, most of the labor is done by workers who are compensated for their work, but in every street, the garden is seen as belonging to the house, the owner. 
of the house. In the crudest Marxist dream, the gardener gives up all rights, claim in, in his handiwork, when he is paid for his labor, and when the owner claims, this is my garden. My respondents in, Barrydale, uh, in the Barrydale workshop hinted at this when they reckon, it is us, it's us who create these gardens, these lush, well watered manicured gardens. We do the work. We create those gardens, right? Um, while they do so, and, and they, they, they say this, and, and note that at the same time, while they are responsible for creating these gardens, they are policed and excluded when these gardens are put on display and in, in competition. All credit and praises are lavished on the owner, little or no recognition to the actual physical labor that would have gone into producing the space. The garden boy is just a phantom presence without the means of garden production. He is thus alienated from the product of his labor, a crude master's in French. Um, contrast this with that of the felt, where alienation is not in the form of labor, but where it is a matter of fences and private property. The felt is really no labor, and the indigenous and impoverished feel closer to this space than the well watered garden plots that signal their oppression and exclusion. It is nature's handiwork, and they are more willing to establish connections to the space the felt and the plants there. The garden in this vein is an alienation of land, water, and labor, echoing the past. But this place is watered by other things as well. Boyhood wants the gardens of Barry Dale and Park. It wanders on the edges with its stories. It is a reminder of the impending drought, with the phantom presence of a gardener descended from the court. European gardens are stalked by Boyhood. And the owners of these gardens weed and water continuously to stave off both the felt and the signs of a return of nature um, that the indigenous vegetation represents. So they keep these indigenous plants out of the garden. They keep them in the felt. They weed them out of their own manicured gardens and to stave off the, you know, the, the felt and the dryness. The ghost that threatens to return the land to its original state felt. Um, and maybe also to return the people to its form, to their former station. Returning to the gardens of Barrydale, water and moisture separate them from the dryness of the people as represented by the felt, and the drought that is represented of the poverty of the people. The garden laborer languishes in the background, prowling the edges, ready to claim back the product of his labor. Even if it's just his speech, like when he tells the story of how it was he who made this garden. He sees it, but he can only desire that the garden would be returned to him, that he may enjoy the fruits of his labor. For now, his labor only serves up cheap, sour wine. So many stories in the gardens and so many ghost stories. The laborers and the owners have passed on these stories, such as the tale of retreating felt that has been eradicated to make way for ornamentals, the labor lost to green proliferation of plant beds, and is in, in beds where we sleep that we might be plagued by nightmares and the lawns like um, the lawns need to get like graves with grave sites. There's the broad history interplay of factors that Peter shows me by singling out Koi. He suggests that this plant contains a history of the Koi people and themselves as descendants of the Koi, beginning with its name, right down to its various uses and in, in um, the alienation of labor. Koihu also makes certain past connections, and this is in the form of a semiotics of plants that is only available to those who can read the sign. These histories are varied, and Koihu features his character and his stories from which it holds the phrases. A word on phrases that remains. It seems that the wealthier, most of the white residents of the town are guarding against ghosts. Or against ghosts. These are the ghosts of the town, dry bushes and the ghostly remains after a long drought that can encroach any time and the near death appearance scares the European the white gardener. These remains, the dust, uh, dusty dry bushes like Puyuhu that were once lush after the rains have now become just visions of what they were before. The felt does not look like a garden but merely the vestiges, the remains of what was once green. The felt haunts European gardens, perhaps reminding them of the story that the vegetation holds, stories that reflect the romanticized indigenous past of colonial conquests 
digital genocide perpetrated by residential school sheep and necrotic desert who take back the land from them if they stop gardening. <laughs> that felt a dry, arid place where the rains once fell is now eagerly awaited, and it's it old where the rains once fell and is now eagerly awaited is haunted by an action. The rain and water spirits of the Koi once roamed these gardens and poultry spaces. What remains now is the dry tinder of the bush and fell. Desecration is the reserve of the ghosts. Dry bones, bushes, and their white stems suggest the skeletal and unburied corpse abandoned to all the sea. After the advent of colonialism, all that remains is the skeleton of the past, pushing to the dry soil to warm the present. How much time? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Five minutes. It's your, I just want to close. I'm not going to read this. I can close that. So let me close with, uh, with the spirituality of plant. Um, I do a whole section on dream and um, plants that call dreaming, and poison being one of those plants that holds dreams and so on, and it suggests that it's a ghost through that. So closing with, with, uh, with the spirituality of plants. Um, this has not just been about go, uh, those ghosts that trouble people in their dreams and homes. Uh, it is about those past injustices that have been left unresolved and have continued to call for the setting of scores and the haunting. Uh, the calls for the setting of scores. And this haunting is, is, is metaphorical. Here it is necessary to briefly distinguish between the phantom and the spectre, two different kinds of ghosts. Phantom reveals nothing, it is unresolved, but it would like to remain as such. It lies and it deceives. The past must remain the past and never come fully to light or be exercised. Spectres, however, are lurking all around, both as presence and absence. Something as much past as future. In the words of Davis, uh, ontology is the structural openness or address directed towards the living by the voices of the past and the not yet formulated possibilities of the future. By holding the future and yet not being able to say exactly what it wants to articulate, yet uh, the spectre differs from the phantom. Boyhood is that the spectre, not phantom, and it wants to enter discourse with purpose. The blend of pastness and security structures the story of boyhood in this work because the plant contains both the history unspoken and not settled, while it also suggests that there's some future which can reside. Natasha Myers, in her work with plants, has talked about the aspirational epistemology, in which we can build a future based on human thought and evolution. The evolution of becoming together is based on, at once, on in the history we share with plants, the current crisis of climate, just as it is at the same time concerned about the future of the planet and the new life to come. Resolution to this uh, of this plant problem lies in any kind of messianic vegetalism, where the future of the planet can only be if there is a new conviviality with plants. Plants remain there as a haunting presence and unthought actions, a sign of plus climate crime and a future destruction or salvation that can bring. Boyhood is such an apparition. It expresses the injustice of the human vegetal genocide that was colonialism. And in its stalking of the gardens and, um, and the like, Boyhood lingers as a potential future invader of these spaces. Along with the invasion comes all the Koi revival and dissolution of colonial and public inheritance. The time that the felt will return and with it the ways and lives of the people. Let us turn our attention to the way in which we have uh, read the haunting of Boyhood throughout the world and some of the ways in which it's seen as a futurity. Um, let me just see if you scan. Peter finds a metaphor with a seemingly dead plant that has so much to tell us about the past. And he brings it back into the present to suggest that there's some future. And it is locked up in this plant. He finds it where only the memory of the dream and dream of water once existed, or the dream of water existed. 
We find it lurking in the presence of the plant specter that induces uh, and induces its metaphor to think the remainders of the indigenous past, colonialism, and apartheid. All the while, um, all the while, this conscious a future to be decoded, where through things like Koyu, he may awaken a new ethno future for his people, the Koyu people. I think I'm going to leave it there. And yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Will. Absolutely. And Marie, please tell the tale for all the arts units in the process of moving towards publications. We're really fortunate to, to get it before it. it's, it's a hard copy. Um, I, yeah, there's so many angles to this, and we're going to be thinking about So, here's the two or three questions that are coming. We've got more than that. And could you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. Oh, let's, let's go. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Oh, uh, something. I'll be after you. Let's put it in hand. And you. For later. Okay. Um, so for my honors thesis, I really want to look at how um, imaginative, um, what, imaginative projects like solar punk, which is a sci-fi genre, is challenging dominant climate change narratives uh, for like a discursive research. And one thing that I have found in very, that's very common in um, very capitalist ideas of um, environmentalism is it tends to focus on this vague nebulous idea of the environmental nature that is very abstracted from these human evidence. It's like save the polar bear, save this tree, but it, without ever tying it back into the importance that the that these natural elements have for humanity. And I do think that there is, and I really like when you said that as long as we're instrumentalizing nature or parts of the environment, we need to we need to recognize that and uh, that it that that parts reflect an imagination of of people, a human imagination. Um, but the one problem I have, and I kind of want your opinion on, with this is it feels like it, it creates this economy of either we see nature primarily as a human-driven, human-focused thing for ourselves, or as something separated from us, mystified, kind of foreign to us that can't really ever be fully understood, palms as palms, as we said. So what I want to know is how do we center the human element of, in, of environmental discourse or when you talk about nature without diminishing the importance of natural entities such as palms? Next round, yeah. Wonderfully, um, there's a few, a few scattered ideas, but I guess the, the one that I've set on for now is just the question of cultivation, right? So, the by listening to your paper with the, the sense of the garden as you know, the garden as 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 Scott was felt in the garden as the kind of the product of racial animated labor and of often you know, of cultivation of things that are not indigenous, etc., versus the felt the, the, the felt and the, and the felt is containing different kinds of memories, different kinds of subjectivities, different kinds of plants. Um, but that's does this what is where does this render cultivation? Is cultivation sort of always already sort of caught within the garden? Is there is there is there are there practices of cultivation that one can think differently in so far as the kind of gesture or more than the gesture, the kind of reading here is evoking so much of the of the weight of of past oppression. And, and, and the sense thing beyond is there a way to think about cultivating that vis a vis a kind of practice with plants uh, that cannot necessarily reproduce the garden uh, 
kind of in the story that you that you say, but can we cultivate? I guess that's the that's the, that's the one point I have. But I'll, I'll, I might come back to this time to take it down. Thanks, it was the two. I'm going to introduce you. So, today, I'm, I'm going to mention this. Um, so, thanks. And also, yeah, I'll ask you to think about it. So, for me, I've got a lot of, um, a lot of colleagues in, in this time. I just want to, I think my comments relate to both of the two comments now. The one, I just want to check, maybe as an aside, so I'm speaking in the comments. I don't know if you've familiar with William Nanard, who shared the history of the Kiffy Dam. Mm -hmm. It really was, it was a recent book launch. So it was interesting and the social history of the important um, plant uh, as an exotic that becomes an invasive. I mean, it is, becomes used and useful. And so it sort of disrupts some of the narrative that, that I think you are. Presenting as as sympathetic as one is to some of the ideas you're putting out there, so I'm just putting putting that out there around, and maybe touches on the issue of cultivation and, and maize and tomatoes and, and grapes. Um, but the other, it's a tremendous thing you started out with the beginning with the discussion around thinking about plants as plants, which is really challenging. Um, and I was, you know, trying, trying to think and theorize it. The question is, where does that take one? Because you then did seem to abandon it. And your, the rest of your paper is, is about plants as meaning and, and value and how we interpret the world and you, you also giving the interpretation of the world to a plant. So I'm just wondering, where does that provocation around? What does it mean to think about plants as plants and the, the thin description, which is also interesting? Where does it take on? Okay, thanks so much, uh, William. My name is Shahid. Uh, we've met through the review, I think, at uh, I Get Your Students in Farm Stuff. Um, so okay, so something being touched, and I also felt that okay, so so I, I also felt that the analysis is semiotic. The claim is material, but the semiotic and the material are not we're not possible to separate them. So on that level, that's fine. <laughs> you know, um, I, I I agree, and I really but what I really like about it is that in the end it turns out to be about water, and water turns turns out to be about right conquest and you know people's memories and you know all these kind of things um and that for me seemed to be the most um you know the most compelling part um of the paper um so okay so my question is the haunting metaphor i can see how it works in the in the cultivated garden right we go to a wine farm if you're aware of questions of violence the place is is wanted right? because you see the black labor only now and then, and you know the whole process. We 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 used to this, so that makes sense. But the felt is that thing of haunting, or is it because there's so little of it left that it just like you know pops up here and there? But if it's everywhere, and we know that the felt is actually quite extensive, I think right in the Karoo and places, then is it really a haunting, or is it just a presence? And it's a presence that. Yeah, I just I got a lot of presences in your paper. The presence of memory, the presence of language, the presence of, you know, being a laborer and moving between these spaces. And what I thought wanted to know more about, so besides the theoretical question, was this issue that Bernard suggested. But you seem to, so he's asking about cultivation in the abstract, but you seem to have suggested that there's a memory here amongst its people of a time when water was abundant and the koi also used to cultivate. So wouldn't you actually be able to write a much more, you know, rather than following this plant thing all the way to its end, wouldn't we be able to write a more convincing social history of through memory, right? But memory as presence, not as wanted. And what would that do maybe to this to, to your project? I'm just trying to challenge. I, I think it's the possibilities you bring out, I think, are really great through this kind of methodology. 
but yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go against what I'm already doing. <laughs> <laughs> so the question of cultivation. So many years ago, um, as social scientists, natural scientists, I just start thinking about um, about the felt, and and this is specifically in relation to say herding grazer, people who graze the felt with their animals. And the idea that emerges, and I think William Baynard's work also suggests that, um, that the felt itself is cultivated. It's, you know, nature is not a space. There's no more seen nature in nature. So, you know, I, I suppose I can't really argue that, you know, that there's this clear distinction between cultivated land and uncultivated mm. land, wild, you know, primeval grassland, whatever it may be the case. But in fact, grasslands are as constructed through the activity, human activity, as, as I'll say, home garden, uh, cultivated field, that matter. Even forests. Forests are, uh, there's increasing uh, kind of research in, in the Amazon. There's, there's evidence from research in the Amazon that people have actually been cultivating the Amazon, mm. that the forest that we see mm. as kind of virgin, pristine forest. Is itself cultivated in some sense. That uh, the you know the distribution of trees, the distribution of species, and so on, is indirectly the result, or well, directly the result of human activity. So I think I've, I've often played with this notion of garden and, and you know how does one actually define what garden is? And one of the things you know that one comes to the one of the points that one comes to is that you know the entire earth is a garden. It's all being guarded in any case, you know, that, you know, humans are some kind of, and, and other animals, that we're, we're all gardeners, we're all engaging with plants in particular ways, carrying into places, and so on. But what isn't the garden? I mean, I think that's what, what I can, what I can say about cultivation is, if I was to go against myself, I'd say, well, look, um, actually, everything is cultivated in some way. And even the felt, if they, if, in the example that I'm using, we have to have a wood town, cultivated, manicured gardens, or I mean, it's not say old red, but these well kept gardens that have, uh, that where there's a lot of labor that's been put into these gardens. Then we contrast that to the seemingly uncultivated, undisturbed, pristine felt. Well, that felt only exists because um, the garden has an edge, or because, you know, certain. Uh, you know, fences that we put in place in order to preserve it as such. So it's it's still in a sense made by whichever activity, uh, you know, fencing or farming, grazing, whatever it may be. The, the problem with or the other kind of issue, and this is, I'm just starting to form this idea of explaining with something, but this idea of cultivation, and here we can think about, you know, our our idea that you know salvation of or or planet lies in tree plant, something like this, cultivating this massive garden of the earth, and it's going to save us from the climate crisis. <laughs> um, it, it takes us back to Adam and Eve, of course, right? <laughs> and some uh, some thinkers in, in critical plant studies call this the floral apocalypse. <laughs> we're going to so drastically change the planet that we're going to go back to this massive garden, you know, back to the snow uh, and so on. It's <laughs> My question has been that, you know, do we go back to that kind of garden? Is that, is, is cultivation the rule that we go through? Do we, um, you know, because there are also things, especially in multi-species ethnography uh, and, and, and theory, but are saying, you know, we need to allow things to also be. And they speak about ethical time. Things happen in their time, and we need to allow things to happen without, without us interfering in natural processes, planting too many trees. Maybe we should just lift our hands over and say, okay, let the planet ride it. You know, let's, let's us not get too involved in it. Um, so you know, that would be my critique of, of cultivation to the extreme. I hope, that, I hope that kind of answers the question. 
So I think the idea around the, uh, thin description needs to be The argument that, that someone like Michael Mata, who writes, who proposes this idea of thin description and new theory in regards to uh, the relation to plot, the idea that he has is that, you know, let's put it this way plants are really successful. They're doing something right by being plants. Plants have capacities and capabilities that we don't. Plants share genes with humans. You know, we have a lot of the same genes. Um, plants have complexity in terms of sensory apparatus that we don't have. Uh, they distinguish, uh, they have 12 different light receptors. Humans only have four. The plants are doing something that, and, and there's a kind of sensing and perception in plants that we can't really match as um, humans. But as long as we get stuck in, and 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 I'm I'm definitely stuck there in the metaphor, in the multiplicity of employment, the multiplying of um, of metaphor and and, and representation. But modern practice, as long as we're stuck there, we're not really seeing what plants are doing. And if we have to step out of the the kind of anthropomorphic framework for a second, and try and step into a kind of cytomorphic framework. Where we try and see things from the perspective of the plant, try to see like a plant, hear like a plant, do like a plant. And Mahana's idea is that if, if we're to, to step into that position of plant perception, seeing the world from the plant's perspective, uh, we have to strip down what it is the plant does. We can't give it too much work. Because, you know, what happens in these workshops that I do when we, um, a simple question, like what do plants do? Simple question like that, plant, you know, you end up with plants doing everything on the And humans just being like, you know, they eat as plants. <laughs> and and that's because that's not that, you know, that you try to go on forever and go whatever good cultural nuances and go on and get more with or go deeper and, and read more from my, you know, so on and so forth. But Marta says that's not productive. That we need to step out and say, okay, let's just look at plants as plants. Mm -hmm. And this may reveal something more that, that we may not be aware. And one of the things that he does in this kind of stripped down uh, analysis of plants, for instance, he, he writes something called resist like a plant. Mm -hmm. And in, in the notion of resisting like a plant, he speaks about, say, the non oppositionality of plants. Plants don't oppose things. Mm. They grow and they grow alongside, they grow around, they they sometimes grow through if there's a gap, but they don't oppose it. And he's saying that in our political, in our political actions, we are always opposing it. So why would we resist like that? And have that kind of so he's stripping it down to the kind of ontological characteristic of say non-oppositionality. Why don't we take that on? Why don't we? Um, and he uses, he uses real world examples like um, like uh, the Wall Street, the Occupy protests. These were very uh, organic, so to speak. They were very vegetal like in his view. That people just came in, there was, there was no real opposition. People came in, they occupied spaces, people floated in and out, um, people spoke to each other, there was no question of sides. And he's suggesting that you know when you look at when we put ourselves in that kind of plant perspective, we can maybe suggest a political action or new forms of political action, something like that. Hmm. I don't know if that that kind of covers your question. What else was there? Maybe we can have another round. Mm. One of one of the, but you covered it enormously, aren't there? And I mean, it's uh, certainly extraordinary. And I quite like your auto critique. I mean, but I suppose my question would be: Can you get to the response now without any, without going through that? Through thinking through the plant, we don't think that plants are good to think. And so you really thinking through it from the beginning to end. And it's not a survival of plant mechanics. It's a lot of other things to gravely experiment. Even if you don't take a biological position, etc. Anyway, there's, there's a lot to think about, and you 
I'm waiting for further comments. I'm just pulling in when you guys come in. Thanks, Ron. But I'm going to extend some notes of things to them. Um, I don't know. Just I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't the foundation of things on the future. This is a good concept that comes along with it. What the seeds you will see, capture the seeds, so that's the garden, settler colonial enterprise. So this sounds very close to what John Hillway and others talk about. It's simply a sandwich of the rest about the foundation of seeds, which is the big story. And then these large gardens that you know, you've seen in the winter is the scene. But um, let's again more comments and questions. I think maybe maybe the, 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 the one the opposite of that is to ask about the garden is common. And can one think about you know in the contrast that Peter is drawing sometimes sometimes you know figuring out your voice and Peter's voice. Um, I think that's part of what's interesting also. You know, there's a certain tradition in kind of political theory that we'll talk about the common. And the common is having is of course when you restrict capitalism, that's how you get closed and people get kicked off and have the industrial industrial industrialization. But it's a claim that politically the common is the is is the, is the size of the term. Now I wonder if those theories are having the common is urban. And, and to what extent uh, thinking the common in a in, in a more divergent landscape or, or with a, a more divergent set of practices might stand in opposition to something like the plantation. Right? But then the question of does the common have population? I think that would be the is there is there a primitive form of population of pollination? Um, would it tend to sort of critique that Peter's Marshall just let things grow. It might not just be uh, leave the leave things entirely in the tent. Can, can we go towards an idea of a common? What would you think of it? Um, okay. Well, I just that's kind of what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, yes, I actually yeah. have a way of rephrasing it. Basically, what I found is there's kind of this capitalist idea of environmentalism that focuses simply on nature, but it's very foreign and difficult to really grasp for because it, it takes away the human element. And it doesn't really focus on what, how, how the true center of climate change is a human focused center. Um, and then there's this leftist discourse that is so human focused, so human driven that I sometimes feel it doesn't take the natural element of the environmental crisis seriously. And for me, I'm stuck in this dichotomy of do you just instrumentalize plants, but then somewhat diminish their own reality? Or do you leave plants what they are, nature what it is, but then keep it mystified and somewhat foreign to humans? Um, but so my question more is how do we instrumentalize plants without losing sight of the plant's own reality. Is there a way of synthesizing the two approaches? It's a lot, but okay. I'll add it to the to the to the mix. Um, <clears throat> so the one is um, actually to pick up on what Bernard said. I think that's very interesting, but I want to push it even further. Right, because if we use the commons, then we are always again sitting with, you know, the process of industrialization. So it's only one context and it's the same story, you know, of European experience. So if I tell you, for example, like in Islamic history, it still, still exists, but you get something called the waqf, right? The waqf is an institution. It's not the commons, but it's a private thing 
that people would donate, in a sense, imagining themselves donating it to God, profit-oriented activity that had a social aim. So you could donate a whole farm into the waqf. The waqf would operate as a business. The proceeds of that were then, you know, into some kind of, and this was a massive institution. They say in the uh, 1500s and 1600s, up to 60, 70% of cities like Beirut and Istanbul were waqf. And when the Europeans came, the advisors and all this, you know, this modernization process, that was the first thing they went for. They were like, you cannot have this, it's, it's not working. So my question is like, you know, there are other ways of imagining, you know, because, you know, the commons goes against, again, you know, it's profit, not profit. But there are many ways of imagining, you know, a different world. And these things also existed. So now I'm very interested in this Koisa because the idea we have of this Koisa, which is this colonial idea of hunter-gatherers. But historically, we know that these were settled people who had towns and cities, right? Cape Town itself was a trading station, right, with, with the Europeans before the settlers kind of took over. And then we also know about just little things, you know, I don't know so much about as much as you, but I, I, there's a lot of springs around the Western Cape, right? So these are now like massive farming areas full of plantations and impoverished what we call colored people or whatever. But at the end of the day, these were once very important settlements, right, of Khoisan life. And these were not just, these were organized places, right, with politics and everything. So my question is like, can we get a history like that? How can we get that? Is there a way to write the history which doesn't fall into the binary, but tells us something, right? Because you're pointing to a history of conflict, not just erasure. And there's a question there, you know, if we can bring that up. That's the one thing. The other thing is more theoretical. It's my last point. Then. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> the radical other. So you're giving us this, it's not your theory, it's what these guys are talking about. This radical other is a very, very, it's indebted to enlightenment thought, right? That European self-definition sees itself and its radical others. But we know historically that there's many different ways of relating to difference that is not about radical otherness. So my question is, if I go into the multi-species world with Haraway, I mean, I also work on some of the stuff. The question is, why is the plant radically other? If we live with it, if we work with it, if we eat it, if we see it, right, it becomes part of us in complicated ways. I can definitely see how, right, in a colonial imagination, especially the garden you speak about, Right, the felt is radically other. I get that whole process. That is definitely there and it's been widely documented. But the plant in itself, do we need to really posit it as radically other? And what, what work does that do? And is there another way of theorizing this? Because I'm thinking that these theorists that you are drawing on are actually still caught in the same, uh, in the same, in the same problem, which they claim to escape. And you know, De Castro and all that. <laughs> anyway, so this is just all. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> why crisis? The second place would be moving in the eyes of the resolution and in the, the kind of natural aim to it, what where it's going to end. So the, the question is is not to continue to imagine a world with ISIS. Or what if we imagine a world without ISIS? So we are absent. We could easily imagine that that world might continue as it does, whichever way. And whatever life will resolve to continue living, whatever life may not continue living. Here it is. The, the, the great arrogance here is that of humans. That we assume that we're going to Continue. We've been around for two seconds on the 24 hour clock. Um, we <laughs> might be around for just another two seconds. <laughs> but life itself, as we says, you know, plants have a 250 million year history. If we stand here as if we are above this, right? above plants, in, in the kind of great chain of being, you know, plants are right here at the bottom, close to the mineral world. I, I suppose I would say that, you know, there is a way to, to think outside. Of, there might be a way to think outside. And I, I, I can't really put my finger on it, but I, I would say that it has, there has been reads that have offered a kind of mysticism and said that, you know, uh, 
that we have to imagine. There's, there's a text that I'm thinking of, and I can't get you all the ideas in the text. It's called uh, it's The Dust of the Planet. Um, it's by Eugene Thacker, and he theorizes that, you know, the way to think ourselves, or that, well, not to think, he says that the world has become unthinkable. That it's getting more and more difficult for us to actually think about the present, the climate crisis, you know, disasters, uh, storms, whatever it may be. Uh, we're kind of being really uh, insecure in the way we have, we can we imagine the world in the Anthropocene. And the way out of that, I suppose, is to imagine this, is to, is to imagine this world without. And once you imagine that, there's no more problem. And so it's a very dark kind of point, right? Dark position to take. But it, it needs to resolve all those questions that we have because the human is no longer. I mean, I think that's what I can say in response to it. What you read in the dust planet, it's really interesting. I mean, that's the stuff on heavy metal and, and religion and so on. Okay. But it, it does make a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. It does make a lot of these points about the climate crisis and, and the world of human. Question of Crisis, yeah. mm. I just want to respond. I do think to that point, I, I, I don't think, I think, but I, I don't think what the destruction, if climate change continues at the current pace that it is continuing at, I don't think the destruction will ultimately be that of humanity simply because of how extensive and far reaching uh, humanity is at the moment. I think if climate change continues as it does, what will be destroyed is modernity. But I think there's a way of thinking where our humanity has been so tied with modernity that we think about modernity, there is no humanity. But I, I think what ultimately is at stake and what needs to be destroyed to end climate change or what climate change will destroy is a way of living modernity itself. Sure. But what I am suggesting, what I think that is suggest in some sense is once you imagine a world without me, without us, the question of climate change, the Anthropocene, all of that simply disappears. It's no longer a concern. It's a concern while humanity exists, yes. But once there's a world without us, once it's just the planet, consider just the kind of uh, forces in the universe and so on, then climate change does not really become a concern anymore. There was something other about okay, let's let's move on to some of the other questions. Really tough questions, I must say. I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna respond to that. So maybe give us a comment on what, what she is saying about the communication scene. So you know uh, we're all familiar with, with the term anthropocene and so on. And there have been some alternatives suggested to this, you know, capital of scene, food of scene, mm -hmm. uh, plantation of scene. Um, there is, there are some, there, there's some merit to some of these. I mean, if one thinks about this notion of uh, the plantation, in some senses, the planet is, is, is filled with plantations. We have palm oil all over the tropics, you know, and palm oil is in everything. You know, we're consuming so much of it that we're probably becoming palm trees ourselves in some way. And other, we can talk about other plant species as well. In soybean, so much of the earth is being covered with soybeans and with uh, maize. And you know, that in still, in some sense, we are living in this massive plant um, The garden is common, the common urban insect, right? Well, I was wondering about this actually in the comments of whether that's the plant Answer the idea for me the basis of the policy alternative cultivation to the plantation, something that they will affect. Yeah, then maybe the performance is gesturing towards uh, what they will do. Or whether that will provide an alternative image to to get through the garden versus the plants. So, yeah, um, maybe tying it up with, with something that Shane was asking about, 
was the Bakoyan, how can we recover that same notion of the commons amongst the Bakoyan that wasn't meant to exist? Um, so, it may have people of how aware people are of this, but there's an increasing movement in, in, the, in the Western paper and in Johannesburg and in Brazil and Italy, but so the other people uh, that's been characterized as Bakoyan divide. So, there's an attempt by lots of people to revive this culture. And this revival has uh, got it, it's, it's got many facets to it. And there are one or two really interesting facets that we we'll mentioned in this regard. One of these has been um, the, the Roy Bo settlement. So the uh, National Poison Consultative Conference or National Poison Council has, um, with the Sand Council of South Africa, has a little while back. Reached a settlement with um, with uh, Spain about rapes and the ownership and proprietorship of rapes. So a percentage of all rapes in cultivation and sold on the market has to go back into these poor communities. There's a there's a common fund that has been created, and and uh, rapes farmers and those who marketed the industry has to plow back into that fund. And this fund can be used for the poison community. So in some senses, there is a way to create a kind of economy to the poor identity. I mean, at the same time, the, the, I mean, a lot of these have to do with plants. There have also been the question on Bunia, Boko, and a lot been written about these. So I suppose there, there is a sense that they have that this is how our past was constructed, or this is how we lived in the past, we lived with plants. And it's interesting to me that plant streets, and it doesn't come through in the paper, but plant streets are so common. When, when you talk about, when people talk about their culture, mm -hmm. you know, we use all these medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. Why? What, what do you think about it? <laughs> right? why, do you think, why do medicinal plants feature so, so prominently? And then I haven't really thought through it, but I suppose one could, one could suggest that it's part of this construction of mm -hmm. common history, common past. We can either try to get back some way to the Hoodia settlement or way or something like that. Okay, um, a plant and its function. I, I forget how exactly uh, frame it. How do we understand the plant, plant outside of its functions? Hmm. Um, Over. Uh, do you do you not know this like a flower? Thing? On the other hand, sorry. So, yeah. for me, it's just you know looking at like, me not like what is your job. You are you? It's like two different things. What do you do? <laughs> you know, you're trying to make you know, with something and just that, but it also just has the essence and quality of its existence. I think that's what you are know, with. Like, yeah, in plants as beings, not just. Oh, you know, so what is it? 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 It's about functions, about what plants do. Kind of about ages, but it's also about, like, say, plants have healing problems. They do something for us. So they produce all these chemicals, you know, and these chemicals are useful for us in terms of food, medicine, and plant. So, on the one hand, going back or just reducing plants to functions, maybe, I can't do what I would particularly uh, own. But there are other tips, and I mentioned some earlier, uh, to understand plants and kind of say their genetics. I mean, plants are genetically much more complex than animals, more complex than humans. Um, they contain an infinitely larger number of genes. Um, they, they produce massive amounts of chemicals with secondary metabolites. They are they are little chemical manufacturing machines. Um, they, and they do this as a result of metabolizing light and sugar and things like that. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, how does one understand plants? 
outside the tongue. But in the pure materiality, it's the famous to genes. Online. We have a question online. Oh, yes. If yes. if you don't yes. answer, yeah, I have more question. <laughs> <laughs> um, last yeah. one or two. I'll give you. There's a comment online which I'll read out, and then you can have one last question. So a lecturer in the department, Claire Lester, says I strongly recommend people go watch the life and times of Michael Kay at the Baxter, based on James Kutsia's novel, the theme of gardening and gardening as creating the self and as resistance is prominent. Um, if what you're welcome to go ahead. Hi, thanks, William. So I'm always so great to to hear your 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 reflections on things. Um, I was wanting to circle back to uh, what you mentioned about um, the plant and how the I forget his name, but the gentleman that you refer to uh, saying that the, the plant was also part of Koi, his culture, that he could see himself in his culture. So there's, there's one thing that, that, that strikes me there. So on one hand, you're asking for people toward the end of your paper for, for us to understand plants beyond the limitations of how we understand knowledge and what knowledge is. But on the other hand, you're, you, one, there's a tendency to reduce all that is that is this plant into a culture and also by talking about it in that way because of course my sense is that there's a, a, an element of reification in how it was described as koi culture um, and i'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more um along uh, about that which i think might be a contradiction in terms so just to reiterate on one hand it's that plants are beyond any kind of classification and that we should observe and watch and let the plants do the speaking. Um, uh, but then on, on, on the other hand, you're saying that the culture, the, the, the plant is a, a representative of a particular culture. Thanks. Maybe this is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to come to the chamber. Okay. Yeah, this is the last one. Okay. I'm not sure if I follow the last question. Um, but let me try and, and respond to what I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing. So, on the one hand, we have plants beyond the next. Um, so, let the plant speak for itself, let it be its own culture, its own thing. And then, on the other hand, you know, Reduce it, or Peter reduces it to his culture, kind of almost singular, his culture. I mean, I, I, I don't really bind this notion of a culture, his culture. Um, but in in constructing an identity for himself, Peter is enrolling the plant. I think I would suggest that, he's, that, that the plant belongs to that particular culture. In fact, in other parts of the paper, I talk about how the plant is being used in food, traditional medicine, I talk about living rituals. Um, and for that matter, it's made its way into uh, kind of Western, because you know, more and more Europeans that I encounter, white people that I encounter in South Africa, I do see them there for a quick with a season mm -hmm. into that imaginary. So I think here, what, I, uh, what I'm just trying to point out is that Peter sees it as significant and emblematical. His culture, whatever that may be, he's drawing that plant in at that moment and using it in a particular way. And I was really interested in, in how he uses the plant. So yeah, I, I think that's what I have to say about that. About Michael K. Yeah, I really love that idea. I, I will never forget the line from the talk he says. See, all I want is the trying to feed him meat or something, and, and all I want is some roasted pumpkin. And he just wants a piece of pumpkin, and you know, it's off his back to the garden, and it's on his pumpkin. It's interesting, maybe I should go. Very good. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah, it was, it was a very so good thing. That's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You worship. People say, let's go William, thanks very much. You have an extraordinary paper and discussion, and thank you all for participating in this. And 
So we use the online people didn't get as much air time, but um, that's why we're trying to encourage everybody to be in person, if at all possible. But it's been a thank you to all of you who are in person today. Thanks for the online people. It was an extraordinary event. Thank you.